So on behalf of the Paragon Book Gallery, I want to say we're extremely honored and delighted to present this conversation featuring Michael Stipe and Philip Tunari, two influential figures in the international art scene. Um, so today, Michael is speaking to us from his hometown, Athens, Georgia. Uh, Philip is in Shanghai for work, and I'm in Beijing. So thanks to the special occasion of the publication of Michael's third photo book with the Italian publishing house Damiani, we are here today to talk about Michael's new book, uh, his works in the field of photography and artistic practice in general. And then I'm the curator of exhibition and public program at Paragon Book Gallery and moderator of today's conversation. Uh, so first, let me provide a brief introduction of our guest speakers. Uh, Mr. Michael Stipe is an American singer-songwriter and cultural icon who led the alternative rock band R.E.M., which was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2007. He studied photography and painting at the University of Georgia before leaving through a power formation of R.E.M., the band for which he served as frontman singer-songwriter until its dis dissolution in 2011. A sensibility that he began to develop during his time as an art student transferred to the spectrum of his work at REM, from art directing all graphic, video, and stage design to writing, composing, and performance, and his iconoclastic personal style. He is known for his distinctive vocal quality, poetic lyrics, and unique stage presence. Outside the music industry, he owns and runs film production studios and continues to make a splash in the imaging field. Mr. Stipe's visibility in the popular culture of the 1980s and 90s left an indelible mark on the aesthetic trends of the time, many of which have trickled down to contemporary culture. Um, Mr. Philip Tenari is director of the UCC Center for Contemporary Art and CEO of the UCCA Group. Since coming to UCC in 2011, Philip has led its transformation from a founder-owned private museum into an accredited museum across multiple locations, a public foundation, and a family of art-driven enterprises. During his tenure, UCC has mounted more than 70 exhibitions and thousands of public programs, freeing artistic voices established and emerging, Chinese and international, to an audience of over a million visitors each year. From 2009 to 2012, he founded and edited the, the first internationally distributed bilingual magazine of contemporary art in China is a contributing editor of Art Forum and launched the magazine's Chinese edition in 2008. Having written extensively on contemporary art in China, he was co-curator of the 2017 exhibition, Art in China after 1989, Theater of the World at the Solomon Guggenheim Museum in New York. Um, based in Beijing since 2001 and fluent in Mandarin, Mr. Tenari is a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader and a fellow of the Public Intellectuals Program of the National Committee on US-China Relations. Philip is a native of Philadelphia and holds degrees from Duke and Harvard. Okay, and then on to Michael's new book. Um, so this new volume uh, shows portraits of resilience and vulnerability in his third photo-based chapter of the Damiani series. Michael explores friends, courage, and vulnerability, pausing the project abruptly due to the COVID-19 pandemic. What follows is the lockdown interpretation of a 21st century portrait with a resolute desire to show our resilience, our humor, our collective fortitude, and our adaptability. Subjects include uh, to the Swinton, John Giorno, Joanne Jonah, amongst many others. The photo book is enriched by free QR linked audio content, which will deepen and enhance the discovery of the images. Scanning the QR code opens access to the making of anecdotes and the intentions behind the book, as told by Michael himself. Okay, so um, 
Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over the screen time to Michael and Philip. Um, so I want to respond to begin by telling us a little bit about how you knew Michael and his work from before, and maybe share some of your you know, first impressions on uh, this new photo book. Well, sure. Um, and I mean, the music culture in China is, is different from the US, but for someone uh, of my generation, so I was born in, in 1979. So like right when I was, you know, in my becoming a teenager, uh, you turned on the radio and probably you would hear a song by, by, by R.E.M. and by Michael. So it's, you know, I think this is not anything special, uh, but if you grew up in, in the U.S. in the late 80s and into the 90s, um, Michael was everywhere. And even before I, you know, knew I wanted to have anything to do with art or really knew what contemporary art even was, you knew that R.E.M. was something different from the other music that you were, you know, that you were hearing in the, in this kind of, very ordinary suburban, you know, East Coast uh, context. And then, you know, as you go on to university, continued to produce. I remember buying a counterfeit copy of uh, of the album Up in uh, on the streets of Beijing in, in in 1999 on my first trip, and it was became kind of like the soundtrack for you know my first uh, um, six months in China when I was a student. So you know, it's it's so interesting, um, and I'm sure gets this all the time but when you have this extended musical relationship to to someone it's like they've become part of your life of course you know the vast majority of cases you never meet the person but um uh it's um it makes it kind of exciting to 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 be, to be here all these years later and um and then of course uh in in the art world i've followed michael's work for the last let's say i mean i followed it for the last 10 years or so um run into him in a couple of places uh, around the world when he's been presenting projects that he's been working on um, or giving different kinds of talks and things. So, and it's just, it's such a interesting thing when uh, someone who's so renowned in one field crosses over into a, a related, but actually quite different field and, and begins a whole other process of exploration. Although I'm sure, and I, th I think this is something that we'll talk about to him, these things probably don't feel uh, disconnected in, in any major way either but um yeah no it's uh it's it's quite exciting to be here with him that's very generous uh philip thank you very much for saying that and um i i actually love the record up a lot of people don't but i'm glad that you name checked it and uh i'm glad it was there for you uh your first six weeks uh your first six months i guess in beijing uh yeah we we actually met in some very exciting places and with some very exciting people uh, which which uh, which brought us uh, here to this conversation today. So it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you uh, about my own work and about uh, where these things cross over. You know, music touches um, uh, the heart and the emotion in a very different way than uh, other mediums uh, and other forms of the creative arts do. And so it is a challenge uh, to shift from one medium to the other and anticipate or expect the same kind of response that I would have gotten uh, uh, from the music that uh, I'm best known for uh, in uh, in America and uh, other parts of the world. But um, but but I, I appreciate that challenge, and um, it's something that I've worked with and worked on uh, my whole life, really, since I was a teenager. And so to be able to um, be able to talk about it and to be able to express myself in these other mediums is really it's really a great um, a great honor of mine do you um so maybe we should start kind of at the beginning at least of this conversation which is to talk a little bit about uh about the book and about its inception and this um it's very special story uh i i, I mean a lot of the media coverage of it has told this story, but I think for the record and for our listeners, um, you know, it connects to this global event that we've all just been through of the pandemic. Um, and it's a story about how you, you maintained the creative practice and adapted a creative practice to a whole a set of circumstances that was, I think, quite unlike what, what you thought it would be at the beginning, which is the story of all of us, I guess, over the last 15 months in, in one way or another. 
I don't know if it was Charles Darwin. It was someone very smart, smarter than me who said that it's not the it's not the strongest uh, uh, who will survive. It's the one it's 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 those who are most adaptable. And so I think this past year we've shown ourselves uh, to ourselves uh, our ability to shift from what we thought was going to be a quite ordinary um, uh, 2020 uh, to something quite extraordinary, and that historically in our lifetime certainly but i think also um uh, just in the in the scope of humanity uh we are in we are in a very very significant uh shifting uh shifting access point uh through covid and recognizing that um the book started with a very simple premise i wanted to photograph uh people who were heroic to me people who uh expressed a courage and a fearlessness that I, I don't feel like I embody or have. Uh, and it's something that I strive for and something I want to achieve uh, over the course of my life. Um, and of course, performing live on TV or in front of 80 million people, you know, 80,000 people at a time, uh, some could regard that as courageous. Uh, for me, it's just what I did. It was my job. And uh, I, I'm very fortunate to have uh, to have had that job. But but um, but the, the book started as something very simple. And then with COVID and with lockdown, it really became me doing shout outs to people who I admired and people who touched me during this very difficult 12, 14 month period where I was in almost complete solitary, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, solitary space, uh, like most of us in lockdown and, um, and uh, kind of going a little bit crazy because I'm not used to that. I'm used to traveling. I'm used to being around people. I'm used to um, I, I'm used to dictating the constraints of what I can and cannot do from a day-to-day -day basis. All of us are like that to some degree. Uh, this book really is a bit of a, a diaristic record of me trying to stay- It's 2130. I'm sorry, that's my computer. Of me trying to stay sane and uh and make it through uh to the end of uh the end of the pandemic so let, let's just talk a little bit about uh how the thing works you know how it's structured um it's it's on the one hand i mean it's a it's a book of photographs um that you've said the idea began as a as a book of studio portraits actually which which as back to this idea of adaptability changed but there are all these other elements. There, there are vases. There are imagined uh, book covers. There are, um, you know, there are kind of typographical sequences. So um, maybe could you talk a little bit about the, you know, the the, the project in general and, and 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 the object that results from it? Sure. It was. It was. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. It was meant to be just as you said, very very simple studio portraits. Probably most of them in black and white. Um, I was reaching out to a number of people. In the book, there are, I believe, six people who, uh, all women, who I photographed uh, as the beginning of the project, and then lockdown happened, and I couldn't be around people. I couldn't travel um, here and there to 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 be able to photograph the people that I wanted to photograph. So I had to come up with different ways to portray them, and I came up with the idea of working with a ceramicist, uh, Caroline Walner who created vases and put names on them of people who I wanted to portray. Um, I worked with a bookmaker and a, a printmaker, a master printmaker uh, in Brooklyn, New York. I live in New York City uh, and I come here to Athens uh, often to see my family and to get away from the city and just have a little bit of time in nature. But my studio in, in, uh, in New York is where I was doing most of the portraits. In Brooklyn, I work with Ruth Lingen, who is a master printmaker, and we created together these book covers also with the names of people who I wanted to portray in the book. And then I dived into my art, my archive of photographs going back to 1974 is when I started, when I first picked up my father's camera, uh, he gifted me with his camera uh, uh, and uh, at the age of 14, and I started taking pictures. Uh, music only came to me a year later and kind of took over actually, but I took pictures the whole time. So I went into the archive for several of the images, and then uh, I expressed, had I gone a different route as a teenager, had music not uh, captured my 
my heart the way that it did and uh, the audacity of uh, the confidence of a 15 year old to say that's what i'm going to do this is how i'm going to do it and i'm going to make it work and the ambition uh, behind that actually makes me sound like a very courageous person i wasn't but <laughs> but that put me into music had i not gone into music i think i might have become probably a failed ph photographer or like a like maybe working for a newspaper um working in fashion perhaps uh or i might have become a graphic artist and a, a graphic designer rather sorry i love graphic design i'm obsessed with the graphic design of the 1970s and the 1960s mm. The 1970s was the era when I was a teenager, and that um, has just locked into my DNA as something that I find profoundly um, inspiring. And so, the the you have the bases, you have the book covers, you have my archive of photographs going back to 1974, and then you have um, my failed attempts at graphic design. Uh, and that's the fonts, that's the books that are created with names like Colin Kaepernick. Uh, Bruce Springsteen, uh, Sia, Natalie Merchant, um, Brianna Taylor, uh, LeBron James. There's all these people that I just wanted to really honor uh, by including in the book and people that touched me uh, during 2020 when I really felt at my most vulnerable, at my most uh, solitary, my most alone, my most kind of afraid of where I was going, where we were going. Uh, it was, for a lot of people, I think, a very existential uh, crisis type of experience moving through the year of lockdown uh and again that that's um yeah so that's that's how the book happened that's what happened um like a, a really simple and kind of dumb question but did it work did, did this creative process make you feel better about the world as it, as you were going through it it did that's a really good question, Philip, and no one has actually asked me that. So thank you for asking. Uh, yeah, yeah, it actually kept me not not just busy, but I was I was in a single I was in a single I was here in in my studio in Athens. Uh, my mother had um, a very difficult summer health wise. She's now doing great, uh, but she went through a series of of necessary operations and some concerning uh, issues uh, health wise that needed to be addressed. And my sister and I were the only people that could be with her. So I was here and I could not go anywhere uh, except to, to be with my mother for half of the day. The other half of the day, I would come here and I would work on the book. And that's what really pulled me through the year and kept me from just going, you know, batshit crazy because I was, I was a little bit um, losing my mind. Uh, I am happy to announce, I, I just left my mother's house before we uh, did this interview and she's she's doing great. She's 85 years old and she's very strong. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it's it's also interesting because this is as this is the book book three of five with, with Damiani. And it's it's kind of interesting to think you would start out at the beginning. I mean, I don't know if it's like, you would call it a five book deal or something, but like uh, that you have this vision of, a, of, of such an expansive project uh, to move to move through but I guess you know as this one shows and as I, th I think has come out in a lot of the things we've just been talking about you're also so open to to change so I don't know what does that mean this this larger framework and and maybe you know what were the what were the two previous ones just so people can kind of get a sense of where this fits in that as well and what yeah, are the, the future first, ones even where the first book I the first book I worked with Jonathan Berger who's an artist and curator uh New York based um and Jonathan went through I don't know how many negatives I have of photographs going back to 1974, but it numbers in the hundred of hundreds of thousands. I think he probably looked at at least 150,000 images, and he pulled 35 photographs that, for him as a curator uh, and uh, a, a, a professor of art uh, at uh, NYU in New York, uh, and as an artist, these images um, presented a case for me as a visual artist who has been doing this uh, the entire time that we were uh, uh, considering me as a pop star. And so that's volume one, that's the first book. The second book is um, called, uh, my computer is sitting on top of it actually. The second book <laughs> is called Our Interference Times. And it is, uh... there it is. Um, it's uh, it's a book of a contrasting. I did it with Douglas Copeland, 
the Canadian artist uh, and, and writer. Most people know him for the book Generation X. Uh, uh, he, um, he's a dear, a great friend. We've known each other since uh, the first uh, uh, Clinton inauguration in the early 90s. We met at the inauguration, actually. Wow. That was a that was an, an wow. august uh, an august uh, evening, uh, but um, this book is a, 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 um, a study and a reflection of how um, analog images and the people like yourself and myself who um, grew up with analog images contrast to digital images. People that are younger and have had computer screens, uh, handheld devices, and back, backlit images. Uh, for their entire lives. And so it's really about contrasting and, and comparing pre-computer to post-computer to, to computer, uh, the digital revolution, and looking at how um, these uh, different ways of seeing uh, are altering not only uh, the way that we regard ourselves, but the way we regard the world, the way we regard each other, and most importantly, the way we communicate with each other. And then this book, the fourth book I've, I've already started on, um, I'm very excited about, I don't know if we should reveal what it is, but if you're going to ask me, I'm going to tell you. Uh, the fifth book, I'm not sure about yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't want to, I don't want to force you down a, a road you don't, you don't want to go down, but you know, I, I'm curious for sure. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I mean, but... <laughs> I, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to tell you, Philip, I, I'd love, I'd love for this to be an exclusive. <laughs> um, the next book is called Collection. And what it is, is me looking at the things that I have collected. I'm very object-based as a person. And so, and you and I have spoken about this before, but it's interesting to me that most of the work that I'm known for as a creative person, as an artist, is um, my voice, uh, my writing, but not writing that's written down in books. It's writing that is sung, uh, my arrangement of music and my music. And so, and then videos. Uh, so, uh, it's all things that are intangible. It's all things that are not, you're not able to hold them in your hands. And so I've always had um, a burning desire to create things that you can hold in your hands. And that's exactly what these books uh, for me have become is each of them uh, with Damiani, it's a quite small run of books compared to other publishers. And I'm able to consider each book as really a little piece of art, uh, something that someone can, can live with and um, and consider or, or look at and pull meaning from uh, hopefully some of the meaning that I uh, hope to imbue the work with, but also stuff that just uh, resonates with, 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 with them in their lives, with you in your life, uh, something that, that connects with you and, and moves you the same way that music does. So I'm a very object-based person. Mm -hmm. Collection is going to be, in essence, me looking at my life, and you can see some of it behind me here, uh, things that I've collected uh, the whole time that I was traveling the world with the band and performing uh, for people and doing things that were intangible. I was going and finding objects that, that, um, that appealed to me. Many of them are by artists. Many of those artists are contemporary artists. Some of them are not. Um, and many of them are photographers. And many of those people have gone on to become some of my closest friends. Uh, a lot of them are actually in uh, the most recent book, Sally Mann. Uh, for example, Taryn Simon, for example, Wolfgang Tillmans, uh, for example, these are all people that are, are very dear and very close. Um, Sophie Cal is photographed uh, in the book, uh, and Michelle LeMay is one of the people that I photographed before lockdown. These are all people who are creators and, and artists uh, who have profoundly influenced and affected the way I not only regard my own work, but regard my life, really. A lot of the choices that I've made um, as an adult uh, resonate or, 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 or knock against uh, ideas that were that were that were brought forward to me through these people. And so I will be simply photographing uh, the collection of things that I've gathered uh, and presenting that as a, a bit of a portrait uh, of myself with myself absolutely absent from it. Wow. Oh, that's that's a so exciting, and we can see this beautiful progression too, from from one to the next. It's uh, it's 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 just. I mean, it's almost like each one is an album in a way. I mean, you could even say. Um, wow, that's a really that's again, no one has said that yet. But yeah, I actually think of them as such. And you 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 find a theme, uh, and then in my own way, you know, I think often, and you and I spoke about this before as well. 
I felt writing songs that I was always being very over obvious and over abundantly over over telling things. And with some songs that are very well known, like Everybody Hurts is a good example. These are very simple ideas that were very simply put forward. But most of the songs and most of what I'm known for is a more oblique, uh, a more abstract, um, uh, a more um, uh, impressionistic uh, uh, approach to songwriting and to lyrics. And uh, and why am, why am I talking about that? Oh, so albums are ideas that hopefully you 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 create this body of work and then you put it all together and you put it out into the world and people draw again from it uh, based on what they need. Uh, but hopefully, a, a bit of your intention uh, is, is is placed there, or you do interviews and talks like this to to give people pointers or ideas like this is what I was thinking of when I created this. The books are exactly the same thing, exactly the same. I have not actually, uh, to tell you the truth, it hasn't occurred to me, but thank you for that. <laughs> these, are, these are my new 21st century version of, 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 century. <laughs> of albums. Yeah, there it is. In, 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 right, in like boutique print runs, uh, right? Because what do you do after you've made ones that have saturated an entire generational consciousness is coming home? But maybe it's interesting to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about the time and the place where you were doing uh, the work of this book. Um, not, not, not just lockdown and COVID, but kind of America and 2020, and, and particularly Georgia, where you're from and where you have you know, such a close connection to where you are right now. Um, but which, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how many of the Chinese listeners understand, but like the reason why uh, America is changing in any way right now is because, you know, after the, the big election, this, there was a second election of, of the two Senate seats in Georgia that, um, that the Democrats were able to win. And that this means, even though it's just 50 seats, but it's, it means things like policies around COVID relief and, and ultimately other progressive policies will may be possible. Um, you've been involved in, in progressive politics for I mean, as long as you've been a, a public figure. Um, but at the same time, you know, last year, certainly, I think as someone who's deeply engaged in American uh, politics, but living on the other side of the world, you know, is even, even not being directly in that mix, it was an incredibly traumatic and stressful time to just think about what another four years of that would have meant. Um, and just the incredible, I mean, just this, the passion that was marshaled and the, and the, the work that was done to, to kind of get out of that place, but also uh, this, this long overdue reckoning, right? With, with specifically with race, which I think we talked about the other day is such, is this kind of the fundamental, as they say in Chinese Marxist uh, philosophy, the fundamental contradiction you know, of, of the society. Um, <laughs> I don't know, sort of, I'm not sure. I, and there's a question in there somewhere, but I guess just, um, I mean, well, maybe it's interesting to ask what, yeah. Go ahead. Or, or what it means to, to, I don't know, like how, how the, the process of uh, making and of creative work um, is inflected by or connects to this larger, you know, consciousness of oneself in uh, in the context of a, a decisive social and political moment. Yeah, and it's not an exaggeration to say that for America and for Americans, this past year has been profoundly, profoundly, unbelievably important uh, in terms of taking the current administration, that of Donald Trump, and kicking it out and saying, this is not who we are. This is this does not represent the majority of Americans. It does not represent our ideas, our desires, the way that we treat each other, the way we speak to each other. We're you know we are a young country. We are we are in many ways quite teenage, which means we're very full of ourselves. We think that we're immortal. We think everyone else is wrong. We think we're always right, and we're going to show you by God how right we are. And so we are very good at showing our asses. We're very good at making complete monstrous fools of ourselves. This administration did that to such a cartoonish level that um, it's, I'm, still, I, I'm still reeling from the, considering that we actually lived through these four years of this, this horrendous uh, 
it, I, I don't know how to describe it except in cartoon terms. It's, it, it's, it's, it's evil beyond evil. What this, how this represented not only our country, but our ideas, our ideas about ourselves, our ideas about the rest of the world, our ideas about, you know, basic policy, whether domestic or international policy, uh, our ideas about climate change, our ideas about race and, and how we, how we regard each other. It, this didn't, this does not represent who we are at all. This represents a very small minority of Americans. And you will find that minority of people who are that filled with hate, who are that petty, who are that small in their thinking, you will find those people everywhere in the world and across history, okay? Let's just say they're the ones who shout uh, in the corner of the park from a soapbox and they're allowed a voice because they should be given a voice. They should be able to say whatever they want, but they're a little bit lunatic and they belong over there. And the real people are over here saying, let him do what he does. Let's get it. Let's get, let's, let's get down to business over here. Let's do the real thing of governing a country of responding and reacting to other countries and to the issues that face all of us last year, of course, uh, globally, that, that biggest issue was, was of course, COVID-19, uh, in America, another enormous issue was uh, racial equality. And it's what I consider to be um, fundamentally uh, the number one American problem is how we have historically dealt with the issue of race and particularly in America, black Americans and white Americans. It's, it's a, it's, it's a, there's a structural problem that needs to be addressed. And so through many things that happened, Black Lives Matter, uh, the death of George Floyd, the death of Breonna Taylor, um, the protests that came out during COVID, uh, people just said enough is enough. This cannot happen anymore. And it provided um, this necessary movement uh, to actually bring about vast change. And we're now watching that take place. We got rid of the mean cartoon guy and, uh, and we now have someone who, although quite moderate in his politics, has proven himself to be quite a statesman already uh, as president and is putting together an, an administration that is representative of America and the melting pot of America. The, uh, it, it shows people um, uh, of all ethnic background. It shows people um, uh, of, uh, of great diversity and people with a lot of different ideas about how things should be governed and how policies should be made, but who are able to actually speak to each other and talk to each other and arrive at compromised positions that, that address these issues. So in America, it's been profoundly wild. Trying to do something creative within that um, was not only um, a lifesaver for me, truthfully, uh, but it was fundamental to who I am. It's, my, it's a contribution that I can make. As a public figure, I can, um, I can go on TV, I can, do, uh, I can write op-eds for The Guardian, uh, I can uh, reach out to other artists and say, your voice means a lot right now. I need you to, I need you to meet my good friend Stacey Abrams, who is working here in the state of Georgia. Mm to ensure that, uh, that uh, uh, black and brown people are able to vote and that their voices are heard because that's fundamental to democracy and it's important to the state of Georgia, um, which is my home state. I was born here. Uh, I paid my taxes here for years and years and years. And I finally said, enough is enough. I'm moving to New York City. I'm making that my tax base and that's where I'm gonna be. Uh, that's because I have, there are more people there that agree with me and I want my tax money going to people that I find slightly more appealing. <laughs> um, but here I am, my family lives here, uh, and I was here in the middle of this insane, uh, Georgia is in the southern part of the United States. Uh, it's um, considered by other parts of the United States to be a place that's more rural, that's more um, less intellectual, more backwards, less academic, um, uh, more right-wing, uh, and in some ways, that's true. In other ways, it is absolutely, uh, absolutely false. Anyway, I was here in the middle of all this craziness that was happening. And um, yeah, I could go on for days about that, but um, I don't want to bore uh, you did or, or anyone else. <laughs> no. I, don't know. I did no. get to meet Stacey um, Adams, and she became, she became someone who was uh, profoundly important uh, uh, and, and someone whose name 
is going to continue to resonate uh, in American politics, I think, for a, a long time. Well, let's let's talk about something super obvious, maybe just as a way and in, back back into the book a little bit, because I and we're probably getting closer to the end of our, our time together. Um, and, and well, connecting to what we were just talking about too, you, you talked a lot about um, about this book in relation to, to gender um, as, as well, right? And I'm not sure we we fully explored that. We've got you know Atilda, who's someone you've talked about as a, a a woman, but who's very in touch with or embracing of her own masculine traits. We've got blue and and pink, which are you know such stereotypically gendered colors, maybe in an earlier time more than now, um, and uh, you, you made the comment that the people you were originally interested in, in working with for this book were all women. Uh, and then that, that evolved in different ways as, as well. But um, I don't know, maybe coming back to this notion of, uh, of fear and vulnerability and, uh, and how that's gendered and, and why that was uh, such a, an appealing starting point. I mean, I think very early on, uh, uh, as a as a teenager, uh, I recognized that my own sexuality was not uh, the, was not typical. Was not I was certainly not heterosexual, um, and I, I needed to explore as a teenager um, my ideas about this. And so, I felt through through my sexuality, I felt um, uh, 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 like an outsider, and I found um, actually punk rock and uh, particularly uh, Patti Smith uh, from the New York, the New York CBGB scene uh, as someone who was heroic to me as a 15 year old. Uh, I bought her first album the day it was released. Uh, I listened to it all night long without sleeping before I went to school. And, and at, the end of, at the end of that evening, uh, I said, this is what I'm going to do. And I set out to do that and it's exactly what I did. Um, but I found within her uh, a woman who dressed like a man, who sang about other women, but who uh, presented herself uh, as a sexual creature. Uh, but within this 1970s idea of um, uh, uh, um, combining the very male and the very female to create something that was very different. She was easily 25 years ahead of where the 21st wow. century finds us in terms of not only sexuality on the one hand, but gender on the other hand. And so with the book, I wanted to, I wanted to do portraits of people who I found to be unafraid and courageous, but also vulnerable. I started making a list. And at one point I realized that the list was all women. I had only, all the people I wanted, all the people that embody this for me were women. At which point, um, and we talked about this the other day, Philip, uh, I was in Europe uh, doing press for this book and for um, a release by my former band, R.E.M. And uh, I got the news from Patti Smith, who's actually now a very dear friend, uh, that our mutual friend, John Giorno, had passed away. John was a great friend. He was, uh, 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 he was a, a queer icon, much like Patti. Uh, and um, uh, I realized uh, that I needed to include him in the book as, a, as an homage to what he brought to me personally. Um, and I had the last photographs uh, that I had taken of John uh, a month earlier uh, in my bag, at my feet, on the airplane when I turned my phone on and got the message that he had passed away. I had the film actually in my bag unprocessed. And I said, I have to be very careful with this film because this is the last images that I have of John. And so uh, he became a part of the book and that opened it up uh, to include men. When lockdown happened, of course, the book changed dramatically, and it changed, and it changed, and it changed again. Uh, and I landed at what it's I twenty-two hours. That's my computer again. I'm so sorry. It landed at what I no what, I was, what I was speaking about uh, before, which was um, trying to portray uh, people through these inanimate objects that, in themselves, have deep meaning. Uh, the graphic design um, components from uh, the 1970s might have deep meaning only to me. Uh, or to people of my generation, uh, but vases certainly uh, are uh, imbued with uh, with a lot of uh, uh, metaphorical. There are a lot of uh, 
analogies or metaphorical like musings that you can make about bases. The same about books and the same about the book, the cover of a book. Um, and then, and then I went into my archive because I, there were people that I just wanted to include, like Gus Van Sant, um, and the pictures of my grandmothers uh, who were insanely heroic to me throughout their lives and remain uh, profoundly important to my development uh, as a young man. And, and frankly, who through their example allowed me to be a 15 year old who not only uh, regarded my own sexuality as a queer person, um, as something that would help shape the choices that I made as an adult, but also gave me, I think as an outsider, the courage to embrace uh, Patti Smith and CBGB and the punk rock scene and find within them um, and within their, even just through their personal style, uh, a gang, a group of people that I, that I felt like I was a part of. And we were outsiders mm. on the fringe and someday something might move us towards the middle. I never uh, imagined that I might be part of that movement, but, but there it is. That was a lot. Sorry. <laughs> Dan, Dan, do you have, no, that was great. That was really, I mean, yeah, it's. Um... So we have Tilda on the cover of the book. It is... Tilda, of course, as a, as a, as a, as a film actor uh, and as, a, as an artist, because I, I think she first and foremost regards herself as a performance artist who happens to act, right? So she, mm -hmm. um, she played, of course, uh, Orlando uh, in, in the film. Uh, she worked with Derek Jarman. Uh, she uh, worked with David Bowie, uh, both of them uh, swapping uh, 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 genders and playing with the idea of gender um, uh, uh, and allowing that the binary old school way of thinking about gender is exactly that. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a construct that we can now kind of let go of. And like the former administration, we can just kind of push it aside and say, Okay, that was interesting in the 19th century. It was, it gave us a, a, a format through which to understand who we are in the 20th century. Not a very fair one. Uh, let's move on. Let's move into right now. And right now we have, um, we have Tilda as a shining example of actually most of the people in the book. And I would, I would regard, you know, someone like Colin Kaepernick. Same thing. You know, I, I, I think he identifies as straight, but, but, uh, but. For a lot of people who are queer or who um, or who uh, re regard the world through the eyes or through the lens of a queer person, he is absolutely queer adjacent and, and someone who I find to be uh. insanely, um, profoundly uh, vulnerable in the choices that he made as a, as a, an activist, uh, as a, an athlete, yeah. uh, as a public figure, uh, simply by saying none of this matters my career my reputation do not matter as much as my belief in what is right and i will stand up or actually i will take a knee for what i can or nail down yeah nail down for what is right and he did that and so for my people he's he's a king that's why he made the book wow yeah i mean i just colin kaepernick he might not be super well known in china but this is the the american football player who who began meant i think as early as what ferguson time right 2014 2015 to, to um when the national anthem would be played at the beginning of the game would 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 kneel down as a as a way of marking and memorializing you know violence against black people and, and other forms of state sanctioned violence so um yeah i had never occurred to me to think of him as a as a queer icon but it makes perfect sense to to uh, when you talk about it in those terms um wow uh this has just been such a great conversation uh dan, dan do you have anything more that that's any burning questions or things that we need to cover that we haven't uh, gotten to yeah um actually i do have a burning question since um michael mentioned to the swinton uh work in the uh, performing arts and of course Michael uh, is in the same same field. Uh, I was wondering if Michael you um, see any similarities between the act of taking photographs and you know that of doing performing art from your experience. It's so funny the first person I thought of when you said that was Joseph Boyce and um, uh, 
he, I think, was quite jealous of Andy Warhol because Warhol was so well known uh, for what he looked like, and uh, people knew him as this kind of celebrity public figure, um, uh, as well as knowing his art. And the way that he presented himself informed the way people regarded his artwork. Um, I think jo Joseph Boys did a similar thing. He kind of, through his jealousy for Warhol's um, uh, being so smart about that, found a hat and found a look and actually did a, the, the piece about the suit. Um, and uh, as a performance artist, uh, recognized and acknowledged very early on the importance of, uh, of documenting the work uh, with photography. And so I, I do think there's a very, I mean, I feel that, you know, if you consider what I did in my past life as a performer, uh, I was combining three or four at least of these very distinct and very different mediums to present uh, music, uh, but with video and film behind, with lights and with the presentation, with um, with a, uh, a somewhat exaggerated um, uh, public uh, uh, persona that's even more exaggerated by being on stage or by being filmed and videotaped, um, and then music and then uh, literature and words and poetry through lyric. Um, and then the po and then politics and activism and and allowing for myself to just be um, if I if I you know just to be myself. I mean I don't want to call myself an iconoclast, but I have been called that, and I don't think it's inaccurate. Uh, is that wow? Did I just really compliment myself? <laughs> like that's not what I meant to say. What I meant to say. What I meant to say was I'm not a normal. I'm not what we, what you would consider to be even a typical pop singer. Uh, I've always had my own way of doing things and i never shied away from that i always was distinctly myself as a public figure and exaggerated that um, to 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 make a point i guess uh and that point was kind of that i was trusting my own instinct and and my own ideas and i had a group of people that trusted me very well with that and allowed me to to move through it and to kind of work with it so anyway wow. These, these, these mediums, to come back to your question, these mediums are very close to each other. I think it's, it's, it's when people combine them in interesting ways that, 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 that we see how, 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 how much there's an intersection or, or, or intersectionality between them. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the audio content that um, goes with the book. I was listening to um, the, the clips I, I feel like there's a great deal of biographical information that sounds a little bit like a memoir. I, I wonder if you think your uh, photo book in some ways can be considered akin to a visual memoir that you know presents pieces of your, uh, your personal life and your connections with various people. Um, absolutely, and that's, that's, um, that's part of, part of, part of um, my interest in, in uh, including the, the audio content and the QR code was the idea of being able to, again, help walk people through what were the ideas behind the book and what was I thinking of when I, when I put this together. Um, I don't keep a diary or a journal. I don't write anything except pop lyrics. And so I use photography uh, in my daily life uh, as, as a diary and as a way to remind myself of my extraordinary life and uh, the incredible people that uh, I have the opportunity to spend that life with, uh, or, or if I don't know them, uh, people that, um, that inspire me immensely. And so um, uh, I wanted the book to be um, as uh, open to anyone who picks it up to understand what the idea is. I, I, I don't like the idea of, of art or of, um, of work that uh, is difficult to understand. I like everything to be understandable to, to anyone. And so I tried to make my work like that. There's definitely a biographic element to this book, even though I'm not really in the book, only my shadow is in the, the final image, uh, which is a picture of my, my goddaughter and her girlfriend. Uh, taking under COVID, uh, we're at a great distance from each other because I couldn't get close to them without masks on. And um, you can see my, you can see my shadow. But that's the only 
Um, that's the only part of me that's basically in the book. Um, but the book is very, very, actually very biographic. I really feel like we've covered so much ground and, and especially once this is subtitled and I, I, I think it's just been a really nice mix. And we've got Michael to introduce a project he hasn't talked about to, um, you know, say a few things about, about this project in, in new ways. Um, and we, we've covered some of the history, some of the context, the past, the present, um, these big themes. So I, I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm actually pretty happy with it. Yeah. Me too, I would just like to say, um, Dion Dion, thank you very much. And thank, thank you to Paragon for uh, being so generous and, and uh, allowing this to happen. And Philip, I'm, 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 I'm really flattered to be able to have a conversation with you, a talk like this. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you uh, somewhere really wild, somewhere very soon with another wild group of people. Because it seems like whenever we run into each other, it's with really good people. So I hope to see you again very soon. <laughs> Likewise, looking forward to that. OK. Thank you both very much. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for you know providing such a rare opportunity to discuss um, this photo book and for sharing your insights and personal experiences. I really enjoyed this great conversation. And on behalf of Paragon Book Gallery, I'd also like to express our gratitude to the publisher Damiani in Bologna, Italy, and Tim Hatton, China and the UCC Center for Contemporary Arts in Beijing um, for their indispensable support and collaboration. Last but not least, thank our audience for watching. Well, thanks. This was really fun and unexpected. And uh, no, I'm really, I'm looking forward to, to, to meeting properly in person uh, before too long. Terrific. We'll see you soon. Great. Thanks a lot.